There are a lot of popular phrases linked to the subject of money, like money can't buy you happiness. But Sarlene, I'm going to be honest with you. I think it helps sometimes. Yeah, just try not having any and see right. how happy you are. <laughs> or what about this phrase, money doesn't grow on trees? I think I heard that a time or two growing up for sure. Yeah, I'm sure you did. Or how about the phrase money talks, which is kind of an interesting concept if you think about it. It certainly is, Charlene, and that's a great subject to explore in today's show, starting with a tour of an old bank that's been adapted into a really cool living space. So let's follow the money. Oh, another good one. I try. Downtown Columbus has seen a lot of recent investment, uh, commercial projects, uh, residential buildings, redoing older buildings, building new. Uh, a lot is happening downtown. We're sort of redensifying the downtown area by filling up parking lots and, and really bringing life back to the center city. There are a number of developers doing this work. Uh, a lot of it is very innovative. And today we're going to be meeting with one of them uh, who's doing some really interesting projects. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. How are you? How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Everything. So you're having a big impact on downtown Columbus these days. I'm trying. <laughs> well, we're here at Gay and High, and I think you control, what, three corners? Uh, three, of the three of the four corners. And so what is happening here at, uh, at Gay and High? We've had some new construction in terms of other apartment buildings that we've built, and we're in the process now of renovating these, these buildings here. I remember the block from uh, Gay to Long on the west side of High. That was a parking lot for years and years. Decades. So you filled that in? Yeah, we did. And that's apartments and commercial space? That's apartment and commercial space. And then on the east side of the, of the street opposite, uh, there are the old, well, some people remember the old Madison's clothing sure. store. Sure. Uh, and then Argo and Laney Jewelers was in the old White Ains optical exactly. building, as I recall. Exactly. And those are all getting redone. They are. So the buildings aren't the only thing you've been up to here at Gay and High. There's a, a fairly sizable sculpture that was just installed. Yeah, absolutely. And that was something that you commissioned? It was. Great. And then donated it to the Columbus Museum of Art. Janet Eckelman is the artist, and she's pretty, pretty much worldwide famous for these types of, of installations and sculptures. And we thought with the idea that if we were going to try to establish this as an arts district and, you know, with a number of galleries, we have about a half a dozen galleries that are going to move in, that a perfect way to kind of set off the area would oh, be to have this monumental yes. sculpture. It is an impressive piece of work. What was the earliest project here that you that you did at Gay and High? I think the first earliest project really was the Citizens uh, Trust Building that like, we worked on. You know, as you remember, with you. Right, right, right. Yeah. We placed that building project. on the register and uh, created, I think it was 63 apartments and some restaurant retail space. And uh, now we're in the process of selling those apartments as as condominiums, mm -hmm. uh, which has obviously been popular also too. Well, I'd love to see a little more. Great. All right. Let's go do it. Lead the way. This space being all modernized, I, I don't recognize. I don't recognize it at all. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't very nice, to be honest. No, it wasn't at all. So this is the entry hall to the 1912 Citizens Building, and of course, over the years, it got updated. So what did you do to uh, restore it to the condition it's in now? Well, as you probably remember, the entire ceiling in this in this particular lobby area was had been stuccoed over, mm -hmm. and uh, really we didn't we, we we knew that there was something below the stucco. We didn't know quite exactly what that was, and we were actually you know very ple pleasantly surprised uh, to find the ceiling uh, really pr pretty much more intact than we might have guessed. Well, it, of course, it looks like hammered copper, but I suspect it's painted plaster. I mean, even even in historic times, they had shortcuts. Sure, and that's exactly what it is, painted plaster. Mm -hmm. But boy, they came out really well. They really and, did. And these, as near as you can tell, these are the original colors that were used on the surface. Yeah, I believe so. 
So let's see what else you did here in the building. Great, let's go up and take a look at the bank hall. Oh, what a great space. This is gorgeous, the old banking lobby. So uh, I remember this, this had been altered quite a bit. The, these fluted columns had been covered with marble and you couldn't see them at all. What else would happen in here that you needed to sort of reverse it to make it better? There was a whole mezzanine uh, that had oh, been added right. yeah. at, at some point in time. Right. Uh, in the past, as you mentioned, the marble columns, or, or the columns have been clad in marble, mm -hmm. which was a real mess getting off, and we had to re, you know, completely redo all of the plaster columns. So a lot of plaster repair, and Absolutely. then I, the old vault is here. Yes. And how are you using that now? That's a small space. Uh, that's an, actually our mailroom. It worked out great. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, it actually almost looks like a vault still because the mailboxes look like security deposits. Well, and, and you can still see the workings of the, of the vault door and all of that. Absolutely. Well, this has been terrific, uh, seeing these projects. You've, you've accomplished a lot, uh, but what else is coming down the line? What do you have planned? Well, I, we, as we spoke about earlier, there's projects on the east side of High Street that are currently mm -hmm. under construction. Right. And uh, we also have a, the renovation of the PNC Tower, uh, both oh, in, right. as a mixed-use building, all part office, part, part apartments, and that's nearing completion right now. And that's the one that has the sunken plaza with a big uh, water feature. Exactly. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, I'll have to have a look at that at some point. Well, what you've been doing downtown, I think, is really important, bringing people back downtown, repopulating the place, increasing the density downtown, making it back into the, really, to the city it once was. Uh, and it went through a long period in the 20th century where it really wasn't as healthy as it could have been. So sure. this is something really important. This seems to be really important to you personally. Why are you taking on projects like this? They can't be easy. They're not easy. But as you know, uh, like you, I'm a bit of an old, an old building you know, buff <laughs> and a history buff on the one hand. On the other hand, I was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. And, you know, there really isn't an example in the country of any uh, prosperous city that doesn't also have a healthy downtown. So anything that we can do as a family and I can do personally to try to make that happen, I think is important for the community. Well, I think it really is happening and it is thanks to people like you. Thank you for the tour Thank and you. for all the work you're doing. Thank you. So a penny for your thoughts, Javier. That's another great money phrase, Charlene. So a penny won't buy you much today, but at one time it was one of the coins you could put in a penny scale to tell your weight. You sure could. You would see these scales all along downtown streets and in popular business establishments. And even though this is an antiquated technology, there's a man in Columbus who's collected penny scales that span more than a century, with the oldest one dating back to 1891. We had the chance to tour his collection, and let's just say it's worth its weight in gold. Darn, I should have thought of that one. I saw my first penny scale at the Columbus train station in 1971 and fell in love with it. I stepped onto the scale and my heart started pounding and then I heard a voice say, buy all you can. So I was into mechanisms, and these are some very complicated, exquisite mechanisms inside these machines, and that captivated me. Over the years of 50 years of collecting, purchased about 200. So these are the top 100 here. This is the oldest scale in the collection, 1891, and it was out on the street in front of the arcade of the Columbus Depot, the train station. This was outside 75 years when I purchased it. I would say from 1890 to 1950 would be the bulk of the collection. There are 30 scales out of these 100 that are related to Ohio, and 10 of them were in operation in Columbus. When they first came out in 1885, they were called nickel drop devices, nickel drop weighing machines. So you had to put in a five cents. At the time, that would buy you two loaves of bread. So it was a new technology. People were excited. They were very entertaining. And then in about three years later, they went for the penny. The penny releases a mechanism that instigates any kind of theatrical uh, events within the machine itself. Some uh, talk to you, some give out movie star pictures, uh, 
Some uh, give out horoscopes, some ask you if you can guess your weight. There were all kinds of gimmicks employed to get you onto that scale. And uh, it was the primary way people got weighed until the bathroom scale became affordable. I had purchased my first scales out of the Columbus train station, and I have one over here. There were six scales in that main concourse, and the operator was in Pennsylvania, and I wrote him a letter, and he responded that he was coming to collect those scales, so I met him. And out of the six, I bought three, and this is one of them. And uh, it's a peerless junior. So I'll, I'll demonstrate it. So uh, quickly just goes right up to your weight. This is the weight teller. Uh, that was a funny story. I, was, I tried to find this scale for many years, and I was in L.A., and I saw this much of it over the top of a car on my way to the L.A. airport, and I jumped out, and the store was closed, but I bought it when I landed in St. Louis. And this is also a Cayley, Cayley Brothers, and that's called The Weight Teller, about 1905. This is quite amazing. The peerless, the peerless people are just did magnificent work, but this is porcelain enamel like on a bathtub. And you'll see throughout the collection some amazing colors in porcelain. This is about 100 years old. So over here are fine examples of mechanisms that do more than just give you your weight. They are guessers. So the idea behind these is that you would dial in what you think you weigh. And I, over there, I weighed 160. So I'm going to put this on 160, and then I'm going to put in a penny. Now the act of turning this supplies all the power. See how they came all the way together, and then that opened a door to bring my money back instead of putting it into the cash box. And inside there is quite an amazing group of gears. I'm just really captivated by the mechanisms. Well, over here we have another way to get a free fair way. And this is one of the most exciting of the scales. It's called an arcade scale. And I love the pun, fair way, as in golf. So you would drop your coin in. The act of getting on advances the coin onto the tee. And then the idea is you try to drive over the lake. Wow, that's, <laughs> that was lucky. Over here you have one of the most classic American penny scales, the Toledo scale. And that was in Eaton, Ohio, in the Central House Cafe. It was made famous by Rockwell on a cover of a Saturday Evening Post. All four of these Toledo scales here have great Ohio history. The Toledo here shows the influence of municipal clocks, and then came along the influence of skyscraper architecture. Mr. Peanut was at the Broaden High Peanut Shop, then he moved out the Town and Country Peanut Shop, and then when I acquired him, he was at the State and High Peanut Shop. So he uh, has done a lot of traveling, but the real story about Mr. Peanut is his patina. Kids would rub his nose for good luck, and that's why his nose is bare. Mr. Peanut is a downtown Columbus, Ohio legend. Definitely my top three scales, one of the top three. Carrying on with the beauty of patina and the story it tells, you can see the shop owner's palm prints where he would hold on to Mr. Peanut and roll him out onto the sidewalk daily to bring people into the shop. There were only 65 made, one for each planter's peanut shop. Moving on to other more exciting scales are the horoscope scales. 
that would give you a chance to ask some questions. This scale was in Columbus, Ohio, in the Olentangy Bowling Alley, up on the main floor. Oh, you could ask, who stands in my way to happiness? How can I hold my sweetheart? Is my sweetheart true? And then you would drop in a penny. The window would open, yes, while you are together. Hmm. <laughs> so, and here's probably one of the most beautiful mechanisms in the collection. You would, again, dial a question. There, there could be three answers to the same question. Uh, where is my hope? So uh, I'm going to throw the penny in so you can see it. Open the door. And up here is the answer. Time will tell. So they would change these wheels and also the bands they would change so there would be fresh fortunes. This scale you would pick out the month you were born and out would come one of 16, I think it is, 16 different answers. So this would chop off a ticket. So you would see a ticket like this and they would bait you into wanting another one. You're fortunate because. And then you've got to put in another penny to find out why. Over here we have another Columbus scale, and this came out of the men's room at the Drexel Theater. Porcelain enamel, signage, tile, the materials they use to build these are cost prohibitive today. In the 70s, there was a problem starting to occur in vandalism, which had not been a problem. And I started picking up the pace of my acquisitions because I would come back to a scale I'd been watching and it would it'd be broken and chipped. So I started getting as many as I could into safety before any damage. This is a Model O peerless ticket scale. I carried this up out of the basement of the Lincoln Theater, but its last known location was Long Drug at 893 Long Street. So this is a Columbus, Ohio scale, and it would hand out a ticket of a movie star. On the back, you would get a fortune. The Peerless Company paid psychologists big money to come up with these flattering words. And then it would stamp your date and weight on the back. It was a private way. Very important. People. Uh, we're getting tired of letting everybody see their weight on the big dials. So this is a Model A Peerless ticket scale, and it was the very first one they came out with. Notice I floated down as I stood up. That just engaged all the mechanisms so it could work. So out comes Dick Powell, and you are sure to succeed in life for you refuse to be discouraged. And uh, also a very beautiful mechanism. It would hold a thousand tickets. Collecting has been a 50 year effort and I really do believe driven by a guiding voice of some kind. Hundreds of millions of people yearly got on these scales in public. I hear stories back from people who come and see the collection. I always weighed myself on this scale in this drugstore or on my way to the subway. I'm hoping to pass the baton to someone else to safeguard this national treasure for future generations to enjoy and study. It's handmade, high quality materials by the mechanical geniuses, and uh, the history is rich for anybody studying 20th century community life. When I first opened the doors for anyone coming to see the collection, they all pretty much dropped their jaws, which makes me feel really good because they see what I see. And I see an amazing American history of ingenuity and design. I would imagine that most people who are sick would buy just about anything to feel better. I know I probably would. Yeah, not always a great idea though. 
maybe think twice. If you find something over the counter that seems to work though, you tend to stick with it, right? From the late 19th to mid 20th century, Peruna was the go-to medicine for a lot of people. The company even had a factory right here in Columbus. Next, Columbus historian Tom Betty shares a photo of the factory and gives us the backstory on this medicine empire. All right, so what you're looking at here is the Peruna building. It was uh, on the corner of Rich and Third Street, and this was the headquarters of the Peruna Drug Company. Peruna was created by uh, Dr. Samuel B. Hartman and really put Columbus on the map uh, nationwide because this product was one of the best-selling elixirs at the time of the early 20th century in the 1900s. Um, and it was a cure-all tonic. It cured everything. Uh, so whatever ailment you had, cancer, depression, you couldn't sleep at night, uh, Dr. Hartman would prescribe a bottle of Peruna and you would drink it. And then the next day or later in the day, he would ask you how you're doing. And you would say, I feel cured. And then he would write down the testimonial and send you home. Uh, what, what we found out later was uh, this tonic had 28 to 30 percent alcohol. So of course, anyone drinking a whole bottle of it uh, would think that they they were feeling great and they were cured. It wasn't until the 1906 uh, Pure Food and Drug Act that Dr. Hartman had to disclose that uh, it contained this much alcohol. But what you're looking at here is the administrative building of the Hartman Peruna Company. Peruna was sold for a dollar a bottle um, in, in 1900 that is probably $60, $70 by today's inflation standards. Uh, so it wasn't cheap back then. Um, this building uh, was beautiful. Um, inside, it was decorated with Tiffany. Uh, in, in later years, it, it, it fell on hard times. Um, there was an effort to save it uh, with a new thing called the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, and this was one of the first buildings listed on the National Register of Historic Places, but unfortunately, right after it was listed, it was demolished in 1973. WOSU's Curious Seabus answers your questions about our region, its history, and its people. This week's question comes to us from Ryan Hudson. Ryan lives just a few blocks away from Minerva Park, a village on Columbus's northeast side. Ryan says Minerva Park doesn't look or feel like any of the surrounding neighborhoods and wrote to us to find out more about its history. Today, Minerva Park is a quiet residential neighborhood, but over 100 years ago, it was home to a roller coaster, a water slide, and a casino where gambling was prohibited. The history of Minerva Park can really be traced to one man, Gary Waldo Meeker. At a public meeting in 1891, a group of Westerville residents complained about spotty train service into Columbus. At that meeting, Meeker suggested an electric rail line with service to the city. Four years later, Meeker was secretary and treasurer of the Columbus Central Railway Company and piloted the first train car south from Westerville. In an effort to boost ridership, Meeker thought up the idea of an amusement park along the line that would draw visitors up from the city. So on July 13th of 1895, Minerva Park opened its gates. The park was named after Minerva Shippard, the wife of the railway company's president, John Shippard. At the time, 15 cents would get you a round trip ticket and admission to the park. The 150 acre park was a scenic getaway, perfect for a quiet picnic by the lake, but also included attractions such as a roller coaster, a bowling alley, a merry-go-round, a nature museum, a pony track, and a small zoo with monkeys and bears. But the park's biggest draw was its casino. Despite being called a casino, games of chance were prohibited and no alcohol was served. But the building did house a 2,500-seat theater that staged elaborate productions and hosted some of the biggest vaudeville acts of the day. The success of the park was short-lived, however. By 1900, the newer Olentangy Park opened up in a much more convenient location just a few miles north of downtown. Minerva Park couldn't compete and was shuttered in 1902, after just seven seasons in operation. 
After that, the park fell into disrepair and became a graveyard for old streetcars. Before his death in 1917, Gary Waldo Meeker pleaded with city officials to preserve Minerva Park as a public resource, but that never came to be. The land remained quiet until 1927 when construction began and the Minerva Park subdivision was born. In order to preserve the neighborhood's character, homeowners incorporated it as a village in 1940. Those efforts ensured that the small lake that swimmers and boaters enjoyed over a century ago remains in Minerva Park today. If you have a question for Curious Seabus, head over to wosu.org slash curious to submit your idea, vote on which question we should investigate next, and see what we've covered so far. Thanks for being with us, and remember, you can catch all of our episodes on YouTube or columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on social media. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Get yourself together, wash your face and hands, and I can show you everything, but you might not understand.